Hey there, this is Justin with Beyond the Uniform. My goal is to provide active duty military personnel with resources to help manage their career transition to civilian life. This week, I'm speaking with Jimmy Sopko, uh, a Naval Academy graduate and surface warfare officer. Uh, Jimmy works over at Pinterest, one of the fastest growing high tech startups in Silicon Valley. Uh, this is is a great interview for anyone wanting to go straight from the military to industry. Jimmy talks about how he got offers from both Google and Pinterest straight out of the military. He talks about how he used cold emails to figure out not only what he wanted to do, but also to get his foot in the door for an interview. He talks about what it's like to work at a high-tech startup in the first 50 employees and see it grow to over 1,000 employees. And he also talks about how to break down doors and do whatever it takes to get your, your, your first job and get that ideal job out of the military. So um, as always on beyondtheuniform.io, there's show notes. I put down the different uh, markers, time markers, if you want to skip around to a specific part of the interview, but I think the whole thing's worth listening to. So here is Jimmy Sopko. I, I appreciate your time on yeah. this. I know uh, things are busy, but I'm really excited to hear your perspective and, and juxtapose it with Shauna's as well. Yeah, definitely. It's super important. Yeah. Well, um, just a quick recap on your background. So Naval Academy 2005, uh, studied mathematics. You were the captain of the Navy lightweight crew team. Yeah. And uh, crew, it seems like, was, has been a trend in your background since then. Yes. Um, you went uh, straight from the Naval Academy to the postgraduate school where you got your master's in applied mathematics. You were also a W. Randolph Churchill Award for Excellence uh, recipient. Uh, from there, you went to Everett, Washington, surface warfare from 2005 to 2010. Concurrently, uh, you got the national team member of U.S. rowing team for almost four years, and you got a uh, silver medal in the 2009 World Rowing Championships. Yeah which is impressive to think of how you were able to do SWO and keep up the athletic side of things. Yeah. Um, and then when you got out, you did uh, a three-month stint over at Johns Hopkins, their applied physics laboratory, and then made the jump straight into Pinterest uh, as one of their community operations manager and now the manager of growth sales. And that's, uh, that's really why I was excited to talk to you of just yeah. punching, punching uh, you know, pretty high weight class, jumping straight into a company like Pinterest. Yeah, so... Um I I got really lucky. When I got out of the Navy in 2010, I actually trained full-time for two years with the U.S. rowing team. Okay. So I was technically unemployed, which is fun. <laughs> um, and my wife, Shauna, who you've spoken with, uh, supported me through that. And then it was my turn to get a job in 2012 while she went to business school. And, um, you know, it was hard because I didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, just like a lot of vets, I think that... Um, you know, you have a certain skill set, whether it's driving a ship or leading teams. Um, and it's hard to tangibly put those things onto a resume and rowing was the same thing. You know, mm -hmm. like I could wake up, I could be disciplined and work really hard towards a, towards a goal, but it was difficult to, for people to understand that experience. Um, the advice I got was to reach out to a lot of veterans who had successfully transitioned in various industries and um, ask them what they did and why they did it and um, what they liked and what they didn't like. Um, what skills in the military did they use that um, allowed them to succeed in their current, current industry or role? And um, through that, I, one, built a pretty solid network of people who uh, could you know, help me um, get my foot in the door somewhere. And two, I learned what was important to me, which I think was like the most beneficial the biggest benefit from that experience. How did you, um, how did you go about that? Was this mostly LinkedIn and guessing yeah. at email addresses or how did you Good kind question. of penetrate through that? So I took th three, I, I, I did a three prong approach to like getting a job. I went through the typical like Lucas group, mm -hmm. JO placement. I applied online and I did my own networking. On the networking side, uh, really good advice I got was to use um, the iSaver D network, oh, okay. which is the uh, the Surface Academy's equivalent of LinkedIn. Okay. And so you can actually apply through the alumni association, through the USNA Alumni Association. And on there, there's a database full of every Surface Academy um, 
graduate who is a member of their association and their job and their uh, phone number and their email. And not all of it is up to date, but uh, that was my primary s- source of like leads, if you will. Mm-hmm. And then I uh, just emailed them. Mm-hmm. And I got really lucky. I knew I was moving to the Bay Area. And I got a few good hits off of it, um, mostly from West Pointers, actually. Which is interesting. <laughs> That's shameful um, for the Naval Academy. Yeah, it was. Um, but uh, it was helpful, you know. Yeah. I got to keep touch with people that way, and um, I had some mentors of my mind who, of mine who knew people and introduced me to, to various people as well. How did you even know what where to reach out? I mean, like, where, was it like an industry approach where you're you're thinking yeah. like maybe finance, maybe consulting, or how did you even start to parse the, the civilian world? So I broke it down into so one I had no idea what I wanted to do so I kind of went a shotgun approach and tried to pick somebody from each industry that I thought I could work in right so management consulting yeah. investment banking technology um, all the way to medical device sales mm-hmm. right um, for me I knew that I, I felt like I needed a veteran in an organization to um, I think two reasons one to vouch for me mm-hmm. because they understood my background and two I think it was a little bit of like uh, it gave me confidence that I could work in that environment mm. because I didn't know anything about them and if a veteran was already there succeeding then there was a chance I could as well oh that's great it's not like you're the trailblazer you're, yeah. you're there's someone at least that you could go go through and say look yeah. this has been done before it's yeah. smart yeah, yeah. Um, ba- backing up, at what point did you know you were going to leave the military? Like, how did you approach that decision of like whether to stay in or get out? Yeah, good question. I um, so I decided. I, so I rode in college. I rode in high school and college, and um, at the Naval Academy, I was really lucky to be in a lightweight rowing team, and I I loved it. Um, mm-hmm. My best friends from the Naval Academy are, are on the team, and we had a good team. It was solid, and I always had this dream of rowing on the national team. Um, that was put on pause when I had to go serve. And so in 2008, I watched the Olympics while I was on deployment and the U S lightweight rowing team did not do well at the Olympics. And I think that really motivated me to try and, you know, to try and go for it. Mm -hmm. And so I decided right then that I was going to work with my, try to work with my captain so I could train while being on a service warfare officer, Mm -hmm. which um, I'm lucky that he was a, a good enough leader to recognize that, um, you know, people should follow their dreams. And as long as you hit your goals, you can do whatever you want outside of work. Yeah. Um, and so I was given that opportunity. And, and once I made the national team and went to world championships in 09 and won silver, I think I, I think I actually realized that um, the Olympics was where I wanted to go. And the only way to do that successfully was to get out of the Navy. Mm-hmm. So that was when it was like rowing that really did it for me. Um, a, a Naval Academy classmate had recommended the book, uh, Boys in the Boat. Boys in the Boat. Yeah. I just read that like six months ago. I, I, I had a lot of respect for yeah. crew before that, but uh, reading that and just the way they explain the team dynamics yeah. and just how, how incredible amazing. sport it is. It's very inspiring. Yeah, yeah it's a great sport. Um, yeah. I you know, I consider myself a veteran mm-hmm. first and foremost, and I've learned a lot. I learned a lot as a veteran mm-hmm. or as in my Navy experience. I've also learned a lot through rowing. Yeah, uh, rowing is a pretty special sport, and um, yeah, a lot of lessons lessons learned from that from that yeah part of my life. And when you when you did get out and you were going to go go into to rowing full time, how did you think about like reserves? Was that did you? Good question. Yeah. So I um, I loved serving, and I really enjoyed my time in the Navy mainly because. I really enjoyed the people and the leadership problems. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, I mean, developing common purpose in the military is not a hard thing. Like it's there. Everybody's mm-hmm. there for each other. And I really enjoyed it. Uh, I love driving the ship, actually. Mm-hmm. I really, I, I grew to like it a lot. And I enjoyed being a slow in a lot of ways. Um, but when it came down to, okay, I'm going to train for the Olympics, like I didn't want any distractions. And I didn't want the possibility of going, of getting pulled away from that. And so I decided not to join the reserves because of that. I imagine the, because I, I just think of my experience at business school and how that was a nice way to decompress from the military yeah. and just kind of acclimate myself to civilian life. And so yeah. e- even though the like um, your experience with rowing wasn't 
wasn't like a typical job. I imagine that was like a decent way to, to unwind and kind of get your bearings yeah. and just decompress. It was great. It was also a great, yeah, all those things. Yeah. It was also a really good time to like, to learn more about myself. Yeah. It was very introspective. Yeah. Right. Because I mean, although rowing is one of the ultimate team sports, I mean, mm. you and the other person or the other three people or the other seven people in the boat, you have no choice but to do everything exactly the same and work in unison. With that said, like you have to, you really have to figure out your own demons and yeah. how to like really push it to the next level. And I mean, training for the Olympics was like the highest level. And so I learned a lot about myself just in terms of like, my own breaking points, yeah. um, how to, how to break through those barriers, um, how to, you know, I don't know, um, even, even figure out what's important to me, you know, which I think is most important in a job transition. Yeah. I think what I've seen a lot of veterans go to is I want to be this role. Yeah. I want to do this thing. And my yeah. first question is, okay, well, tell me what that means. Like, what does doing that thing mean for your day to day? Yeah. And I think what I ultimately find out most of the time is that they really care about a few very special things. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens they think that role yeah. will give them those things. Yeah. But I, I would argue that most veterans don't know enough about the civilian world to really make that assessment. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's very accurate. It, it was for me in, in particular, like, and it's, it is interesting because it's almost like um, you're teasing out of the person, like, what are the needs that you're trying to meet? Like, I yeah. get that you want this role, but what, what is that doing for you? Yes. And there's so many different strategies to meet that need that yes. doesn't, doesn't necessarily revolve around whatever job that they probably heard about through a friend or through just random yeah. pieces of data. Right. Yeah. So how did you, then how did you make the break from row? Like, at what point did you say, I'm going to move on past rowing? Yeah, so I, um, so when I got cut from the Olympic team, I knew I was finished, you know, yeah. I, uh, was cut on April 13th, 2012 and, um, I was the last cut. So I was the fifth guy and, you know, I had a decision right, not right then, but I had to make a decision pretty quickly as to whether I wanted to continue to go for the next cycle, the next Olympic cycle, which ended yesterday. Wow. <laughs> um, and so I, I knew that. You know, my wife and I had been away from each other for a long time because of the Navy and rowing. Um, I knew that I couldn't really start a career if I was still rowing. Uh, it's you just, I, I could not do that. I had to commit fully to it. And I, and I was done with that part yeah. of my life. Um, so I knew pretty much right away that I was going to transition. Uh, the next question was to what? Yeah. yeah. So. And had you... Um I mean, it sounds like you were all in on rowing. I'm just wondering if yeah. there was like any exploration during those two years. Was it kind of like there two was. years? Okay, it was. Yeah. yeah. So I actually thought I would be a teacher and a rowing coach. Oh, um, yeah. And, you, you, and you founded the U.S. Lightweight Rowing Association along the way. Too, yeah, right? which we, yeah. we did after the Olympics okay. in 2012. We did yeah. it in the fall of 2012, um, beginning of 2013, and we're still running that. Mm. Um, you know, the... Um, the Olympic training for the Olympics is not all roses, you know. Um, <laughs> it's it's hard in that there's not a lot of support for some sports, and rowing yeah. is one of them. We're actually severely underfunded compared to a lot of our competitors, and you know there were a lot of times when I slept on couches, and you know if my wife wasn't working, I would have had to figure out how to get money somehow um, because the Olympic Committee does not give athletes very much money. Even the best athletes who win gold medals at, at the Olympics, which the women's U.S. rowing eight just won their third consecutive Olympics. At most, they'll get maybe two thousand dollars a month. Well, to live, and then you have to live in Prince, New Jersey, which is pretty high <laughs> yeah. cost of living. So, um, you're not crushing it in any way, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and stuff. Yeah, and so, um, so then leading into Pinterest, then how did you start to hone in on technology? Yeah, and, and how was it? Was it the draw of technology or was it closing doors on other things or what, what funneled you in that way? Yeah. So uh, there's a number of variables when looking for a job. There's, you know, the actual industry, the size of the company, the people at the company, um, the culture, if you will, the, um, the location of the company. Yeah. Location was guaranteed. Like I was going to be in the Bay Area. So that was mm -hmm. one thing I didn't have to think about. My yeah. wife was going to graduate school here and I didn't have to thinking about going anywhere else. So that was good. 
So then what I did was I asked a bunch of people those questions about, you know, what do you do? Um, why do you do it? What do you like? What do you don't like? And I talked to um, a few people in tech and I really enjoyed what they had to say. Um, and some of those, some of the themes that came out in all my conversations within tech and outside are, um, I learned what was important to me, which was I really wanted to work in a meritocracy. Yeah. I wanted to work in a fast growing company mm -hmm. because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do because mm -hmm. I never, I mean, last time I worked in the civilian world, I was in high school. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, a lot had changed. Um, I knew I wanted to work with really smart people, um, with A players, if you will. And um, I wanted to work in a place where there was great leadership. Yeah. Because for me, I actually think like, The only way to grow a company is to develop people. Mm -hmm. You grow people and people build the company. Yeah. Um, and I really wanted to be in a place where that was like believed yeah. and executed well. Mm. And I got lucky that I was introduced to uh, a guy named Don Fall, mm. who was the head of operations at Pinterest at the time uh, I was transitioning. And through my conversations with him, I... Um, One really enjoyed my conversation with him, and I learned that Pinterest overall like met those different needs. Yeah, and so he was building out a small customer support team. Pinterest was about 70 people. Well, when I started talking to them, there were about 30, about 40, 50 people, mm. and um, the customer support team was four people maybe. And uh, so I applied to do customer support tickets. Mm. Um, that's what I applied to do, <laughs> knowing that yeah. Um, If it was a fast-growing company, yeah, and I did well, yeah, I can create my own opportunities for myself. Oh man, that's so um, smart! It's like uh, it's that rocket ship analogy. Yes, like you get on a rocket ship, yeah. you're a known commodity, and you can be the first person to switch into new roles as they emerge. Exactly. Yeah. And so I got really lucky that Don convinced people that they should give me a shot. Yeah. They had to fight for it. It's not easy. Yeah. Um, and I also got really lucky that I think I I really put that decision to test or those criteria to test when I. Um, figured when I got a, a, a job offer from Google about three days uh, within three days of my Pinterest offer. Wow! So I had two competing offers from di very different companies. Yeah. Here's this beta bet that you know, as 70 people, it's a complete mess. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, the, so many things were uh, just unstructured and and, and you know n nascent at mm -hmm. Pinterest. And here's this giant behemoth that like is a great job, great you know decent money right off the bat and a bunch of infrastructure to teach you a lot of things um pick one yeah and i chose pinterest uh because of those those criteria um mm. the people were amazing uh the diversity of thought the diversity of backgrounds the just a caliber the leadership was awesome um how, how did you um so i think i you know from my perspective it's pretty extraordinary to go essentially directly from the military and, yeah. and you have options at Pinterest and Google or my understanding is that most people that would go into that have gone to, through either another organization first yeah. or through a graduate school yeah, program like an MBA. Yeah. so I, I'm wondering what advice you would have for people wanting to try and make that yeah. direct transition or how you prepare yeah. for the interview or what, what do you think made the difference yeah so I think uh, so three pieces of advice one is When preparing for the interview, like study, like it was a pro board. Yeah, you yeah. know, like get smart on their business, get smart on their product. Yeah. Um, with that said, like be humble and acknowledge that you have a lot to learn. Um, but you have to like study. Like I read the book How to Get Hired at Google. Yeah. You know? I mean, which yeah. seems very corny and cheesy, but yeah. like they asked me how many ping pong balls you can fit in a 747, and I, you know, gave the structured, you know. Mm -hmm to be honest, like kind of useless answer yep. that they bought, you know, mm -hmm. and those questions are shown to not be very effective in interviewing, but I knew they were going to ask it mm -hmm. and I knocked out of the park because I had studied for it. Yeah. Um, second piece of advice is, uh, don't like be bold in, mm -hmm. in introducing yourself. I think that that, um, that was one of the hardest things for me as a vet. Like the Navy doesn't really teach you to like, reach out to people you don't know yeah. you know, or the military doesn't. And so cold calling, networking, like that stuff's really important. Yeah. And the best advice I got was, um, from a mentor of mine, he goes, because I, 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 
told him that I was kind of worried about this. Like, well, what if they don't answer me? Or what if they say no? Or they think I'm crazy? And he goes, well, what's the worst thing going to happen? You know, you're going to see them in a football game and you're going to hate them. Yeah. And they're not going to know who you are. So the worst thing going to happen is nothing. Like, yeah. You have nothing to lose. Like, reach out to them. And so I cold emailed a lot of people. Um, and the last thing, which I well, think... Just out of curiosity, because I... So I've done... Yeah. A lot of like cold emailing from sales, business development, yeah. fundraising, a lot of that. I'm curious, what what was your sense of hit rate for every 10 or 100 emails you sent out? Like, what was the response rate? You know, I, I, I don't remember. Yeah. Um, I think it was pretty high, though. I was okay. pretty targeted. Yeah. Um, I would reach out to, so I basically had two, so it was all service academy guys. Yep. Um, so we already had something in common. And from my experience, most service academies, service academy alumni want to help other service academy yeah. alumni. Yeah. Um, so I think that was one thing. Uh, two, I went high and low. Yeah. So I went for like the COOs and the yeah. CEOs, which my hit rate was probably a little lower. Yeah. And I went for the guys that were, you know, I was 05, so the 03s, the yeah. 02s. Yeah. And they definitely know your pain. Mm-hmm. So they were more, they were pretty willing to, um, to write back. That's great. Yeah. That's great. And then the third piece of advice I would give, and I think this is unique, this is kind of to your question of like, how did I do this without going to business school or doing another job first? I took a step back in my career, yeah. you know? And it was a risk. Like, it was humbling being a 30-year-old who was had trained for the Olympics, was a navigator on a warship, and had a, had a ton of responsibility. It was humbling to sit next to 20... Three twenty-four year olds and do customer support tickets and help grandmas get back into their Pinterest account. <laughs> um, and I did that yeah. for three months. Well, and uh, and I knew that it was a risk, but I also knew that um, I believed in the leaders in the company. The people were good. We the Pinterest already had product market fit, mm-hmm. and so um, I just tried to come in and like honestly do more at higher quality than all the 23 year olds. Yeah. Like, that was my only, yeah. I was like, these guys haven't trained for the Olympics. They yeah. haven't been on a ship. Like I can outwork. I, I'm pretty sure I can like at least try to outdo them. And that was my goal. And you know, it's work. Though. Yeah. Like we hire really smart, talented people. But, um, so I'd say that was a piece of advice for someone coming in who has not mm. done the traditional like MBA prior experience route. Yeah. Is I had to take a step back. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's incredible though that, that rolling your sleeve up and, you know, yeah. essentially saying I'm going to clean the toilets if I have to. So yeah. I imagine that goes a long way to just showing motivation and drive. And, and it worked because you had talked about you, you targeted meritocracy. So yeah. that, that might not be the right strategy for something that's more hierarchical, but knowing like, look, if this organization values yes. a strong work ethic, I know right. I can knock this out of the park. And I don't think I thought this at the time, but what I realized as I, you know, moved into management at Pinterest and have manage three different teams like that um that you know grunt work if you will Mm -hmm. did a few things one it gave me a ton of street cred yeah right with my team which goes a long way two it gave me a ton of empathy yeah (laughs) which is also it's like to be in those i know what it's like and 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 you can leverage that two ways like one i i i do have empathy for my team i understand how hard their job is and two um, I, ha- I understand how hard their job is and I, and what it's like. So if they complain to me, I'm like, listen, I completely get it, but yeah. like, here's the problem we have to solve. You yeah. know? Um, so I can challenge them back right? yeah. with a, with a little bit of foundation to stand on. Mm. I love that. And, um, so now that you're, so you went from community operation or co- almost like customer support to yeah. the community operations manager. Yeah. And, um, I'm wondering, um, it, we talked about this right before we started recording, but like, what what have you found is like the difference between military leadership and leadership within tech? Yeah, it's um, so it's interesting. I, I think that at a high level, not much is different. Yeah. Right, I view my job as studying the vision and empowering people. Mm. Right, and I think that that is no different than what I did as a divo. Yeah. Right. We have been serving six months, mm. right? There's your vision, right? <laughs> you know, we're going to deployment, you yep. know? And then empowering is, okay, where's the inspection checklist? Or, yep. you know, okay, you run all the maintenance. Like, I, I don't need to be on top of it because you're on top of it and empowering people in that way or, like, being on somebody's butt about, yeah. you know, something the XO is, you know, cranky about. Um, so at a high level, that's, you know, um, 
that's one thing. Uh, it's all the same. I think tactically, uh, you know, the um, so there's a lack of structure mm-hmm. in tech, mm-hmm. right? At a company that's growing from that was seventy people four years ago and is now a thousand. Unreal, right? And so um, you, you know, I, I, I mean, there was there was no. Um, there was no maintenance manual. There was no inspection checklist. There was no real way to hold people accountable. Yeah. Right. And so the lack of structure, like it gave you freedom to build what you want and optimize towards success. Um, as you saw it as a leader, mm-hmm. which is a little bit different than the military success is pretty much defined for you. Yeah. Um, so I think that was one of the big differences. Um, let me think. Oh, another one is, uh, you can choose who works for you. Mm. And I think that's really important and something like firing people is really hard, mm. you know, and you kind of fire people in the military, but not really. Yeah. You know, um, and hiring is really hard. Like that's something I didn't have to do as a leader in the military. And so those are two different muscles that you really have to like figure out. Mm. Um, and then I think the cross functional work is very, very different. Mm. Um, and so there's lead leadership is like managing your team. That's one, but you also have to lead across the company. Like, horizontally yeah and so when you're building products for consumers and you're on customer support or sales which is my background and you're essentially you're at the tip of the spear yeah you're talking to users whether it's someone who wants to spend money on ads or someone who's using pinterest to discover things they love and do those things um you have to figure out how to one influence the product team um to help create the best product for Pinterest while too like trusting product enough that they're not going to build everything to solve all your problems and help your team understand that. Mm -hmm. I never had to do that in the military. Yeah. So that's a little different. I I've, I've always viewed that, um, any customer facing role, is like such a vital piece because it gives you right. You're, you're the, the main voice of feedback for the engineers on what to build and, and they can't always build everything. So you also have to be, the buffer for the company of, of helping people in the, when the product doesn't fit all of their needs or use cases. A hundred percent. And you yeah. can't be the damn XO to yeah. your team either. You can't say, well, product's not building that. Like they're, they're screwing us. Yeah. You, um, you have to really push your team to, to understand that have to have empathy for product, which honestly, like I messed that up a million times over. Yeah. I, I used, I was not, I don't know. I just didn't have empathy for them. And then after about a year of like leading the customer support team, I finally figured it out. And I was like, well, they do have the same goal we have, but they're just, you know, they're solving for different problems sometimes. And, uh, it was a tough lesson for me to learn. Mm. And, um, when you were uh, community operations manager, what was your, what was your day to day life like in terms of, uh, yeah. hours, travel mm. types of people you were working with? Yeah. I mean, taking me back like, <laughs> back in the day um, so I, I did so I when I was community ops manager I did I managed two different teams over two different time spans one the first year was the customer support team mm-hmm. and the second year was our spam operations team okay which is a little bit of a different problem so I'll talk about customer support mm-hmm. customer support I probably spent my day um, focused on three different things one was uh Managing, leading my team, mm-hmm. right? Setting goals, doing one-on-ones, um, working on career development, uh, all of those things. How many people were that were in the team? Or so we started with two, okay. and we built it up to seven. Okay, so, so you did a lot of hiring. A lot of hiring. Yeah. So um, that brings me to the next one, which yeah. is like team building, yeah. right? Whether it was building out expectations for different levels, yeah. or hiring people, or doing counseling, you know, mm-hmm. and, and things like that. Um, the team building part of it was, was a big part. And the third part was, um, engaging with product and engineering. Mm. And so, uh, which was fun. And I think that's where I probably learned the most, you know, I was, I had an operations background. I could think through problems in uh, an operations way in a systematic way. Mm. Um, but communicating back and forth with product was a challenge for me, a new, a newer challenge. Mm. Um, it's a little bit different than talking with, you know, engineers in, you know, in the engineering space of a frigate. Yeah. Right? Like, everything's already defined. Everything's already built. Yeah. 
You know, you're just like monitoring systems and making sure things are running. Here, you're building everything brand new. Yeah. Which brings into account, and you have a customer. Yeah. Which is, brings into account a few different problems. What about on, on the team building side? I've always found it interesting that my experience in the military was with leadership, this whole sense of fraternization and oh, yeah. this, this heavy line between the people you lead and how you react. Yeah. And then so much for me, at least on the civilian side, is like you want to have, it's not, you know, maybe not friendship, but you want to have a good rapport. You're, you're going out to dinner, you're doing yeah. team events. I'm wondering how you've navigated that or, or how that's different for you. Yeah, it's so it's funny. I come from, my father owns a seafood business in Southeast Virginia. I, I was the first person on my dad's side to ever get a college degree. I come from a very blue collar family. Yep. And I always felt out of place in the wardroom. Yeah. I never felt comfortable there. Yeah. Um, I actually really enjoyed talking to chiefs. Like part of me thought I should have been a chief. You know? <laughs> um, and I, so I don't know if I was ever really good at the, like the delineation of officer yep. and enlist. I knew that there was a good reason for it. I think it took me a, it, it took me a long time to learn that yeah. as an as a junior officer, um, and I get it. But at the same time, it wasn't natural for me. Yeah. So when I came to tech, and there was this natural like open space to communicate and be one with your team, uh, I think it definitely fit into my personality a bit more. Yeah. And so the way I, I mean, the way I approach it is, um, again, like vision and empowerment. I'm a big believer of servant leadership. Like I'm here to help you guys hit your goals. Yeah. Because honestly, like that's the only way I hit my goals. Yeah. My goals are their goals. Yeah. Um, I don't control very much. <laughs> uh, and yeah. so, and that's, you know, I think that's one reason why, um, you know, building rapport, building trust, uh, is super important. And like, if you're going to come to work and spend a bunch of time with people and, uh, to solve really hard problems and probably have some stress in your life, you might as well have fun. Yeah. So, yeah. um, I think all of those things, like it wasn't that hard of a transition for me. I think it more fit my natural state. Yeah. And then what, what about for when you went in on more in the sales capacity, managing the growth sales? Yeah. What was that like? What was the lifestyle like and kind of the day to day like there? Yeah. So, um, so I worked on spam for, you know, a little over a year and what I, my goal there in doing the spam job was to work with engineers mm. and I wanted to get that experience. Um, and I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I would say that is in, in my time with, with Pinner ops, with the community support team, customer support team was very internally focused as well. Right. Talk to product. I would say the biggest difference between sales and my previous life in, in customer support and spam was it's outward facing way more outward facing. So we are going to market with a set of solutions to help advertisers solve their marketing objectives. Mm -hmm. And in that, um, I have to, you know, really be thoughtful about how I, who I'm talking to and how I'm talking to them. And a little bit more so than I did when we were, you know, a 70 to 250 person startup. Yeah. Um, you know, you can kind of just go knock down walls and doors and, you know, go rogue if you would. Uh, it doesn't work as well in, in advertising. <laughs> so I found that out the hard way. Yeah. Um, so I would say uh, that's one of the biggest differences is I'm in market, yeah. right, in my day-to-day, -day, a lot more. Um, the leadership's different. You know, we have very objective goals in sales, which I love, and it fits my personality, like, really well. Um, and I have a really good team of six sellers, and each one of them does their job differently. Mm. And so I have to figure out how to objectively measure them while letting them like run their own race, Yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that is a challenge. Like part of me wants to say, well, I would do it this way, but that's not my job. Mm -hmm. Like I hire them to do their job. They're probably better than I am. Yeah. And so it's a lot of, okay, well walk me through your thought process. Like, and I learn a ton from them. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, can we get that each, every, everybody else has their own ideas, so get them together to share. Um, so my day-to-day, -day, the biggest change is I'm in market more. Um, I, I think that I, you know, very recently learned that as well, which yeah. is like, yeah, I have my approach, but people are so different. So it's not about yeah. teaching someone to do it my way. It's like being able to choreograph that objective right. and support them in whatever approach is best for them. Yeah. 
what what about um, like weekends working late? Like, what's the what's oh, yeah. the lifestyle component? Good question. So I have an eight month old. Yep, which definitely changes things. Uh, so before my daughter was born, I would uh, you know I'd be at Pinterest from probably six thirty a.m. till seven p.m. Well. Um, now I got here at six thirty, so I get a parking spot, mm-hmm. and I worked out for an hour. Yeah, and you know I would have some breakfast, yeah. and then I would work all day, and I'd probably get some dinner around six six thirty, mm-hmm. and then I'd go home. Yeah. Um, the the day to day changes so much that it's hard to get into like the tactical like what do I do all day? Mm-hmm. Um, I would say in sales, like a few things. One, we I'm on the phone or in person with, with clients a lot. Mm. I sit down with product and uh, relay the, the problems our advertisers are having and try to um, then communicate what they're working on back to our to my team. Yeah. Uh, I, um, you know, a lot of like sales strategy and sales leadership type stuff. So building out comp plans, um, mm. building out, are we going to verticalize? What's the team structure? What's the optimal, you know, account manager to account executive ratio, like tactical yeah. questions like that. Um, those are the things I, I would do in this job day to day. Um, now, after my daughter was born, I get on the train at 7.30, I get in the office at 8.30. I am very efficient with my time until 5.15 and I walk to the train and I get home at 6.30. I immediately go into, go into dad mode, which is it's food time. Yeah. Um, so. I'm usually cooking food for my wife and I while my wife's feeding Ad- Addison, our daughter, or vice versa. Um, then bath time at 7, <laughs> and then, you know, it's uh, story time at 7.30. Yeah. And then at around 8 o'clock, I will get back on my computer and answer emails for probably an hour or an hour and a half. Well. Um, so uh, definitely more concentrated in work after yeah. I had a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know, I know we're running short on time. I'm wondering if, um, if someone is on active duty and they're thinking of getting out, what, you know, what other advice would you have for them, whether it's a resource or whether it's um, just anything that you would, you, would, you would want them to know? Yeah, I think, um, I think the first thing is like be, uh, be open to the fact that you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, and with that, be really willing to reach out and and ask people, you know, what they do and why they do it and what they like and what they don't like. Because my push for veterans is try to figure out what's important to you, not declare a role that you want to do. Yeah. Right. I think that's really hard mm-hmm. because most because the hardest thing for me in transitioning was the lack of structure and and in a lot of things but the hardest thing for me was in career development yeah like I knew in 20 years in 17 years after being an ensign Mm -hmm. I would be CEO of a ship Mm -hmm. right like not guaranteed but I knew exactly what I needed to do to get there yeah and I get here and I'm doing customer support tech I'm like when can I manage and they're like "Uh, I don't know you know I don't even know what that means here yeah and then you know well what's after the community ops team well we don't know what teams we're building and Pinterest might stop growing and like there's all these question marks and so um, be open to just learning and figure out what's important to you and then um, like try to find the company that's perfect for you Um, other other advice I got was don't settle Mm -hmm. which is also really hard advice because the job search can take a long time so for me I started in April of 2012 I got an offer in September so it take took a while, um, and I said no to a few places before I said yes to Pinterest because I had someone that told me don't settle. Yeah, um, which is really tough, and it really depends on your situation. Mm-hmm. Um, I was willing to take on some risk going to a small company. I didn't have kids. My wife was going to business school, so we were already poor. It didn't mm-hmm. really matter. Uh, we <laughs> Drop in the bucket. Yeah, remember? Yeah, yeah. Um, and. Uh, so I, I got lucky in that I didn't settle and I found this place. Yeah, I think that's like really good advice across the board because um, it does take a long time to, to, to figure out what you want to do. I liked what you talked about with just knowing yourself and knowing yeah. what you wanted. 
And I can, I could imagine, you know, for myself in, the, in that position, I can imagine like May, June, like you're starting to, to look at your bank account going down and starting to feel like, well, I should just take it. And that, that fear could drive you to, to choose something before you find what's really right for you. Yeah. And I think you optimize for the wrong thing yep. in that, in that situation, which is really, really hard. Yeah. Um, and again, depending on your situation, like if I had kids, that might've been a very different situation. Yeah. Um, I probably went out to Google. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, to be honest, and, and it's interesting too because having chosen what at the time was a startup, you, um, um, what at the time was a startup, you're introducing even, even more ambiguity around career progression. Like you were talking about, like there, there literally is no uh, way to gauge how long until your manager. Where, where at Google, you would it's probably much more defined in terms much of more. in general two or three years to this position. Yeah, but for something for people to know if they go to a company that's I don't know, sub 500 people, it's going to be a little bit more figure out as you go. 100% it is. And it took me a while to get, to become okay with that. Yeah. Um, There's also opportunity in that. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, because there's nothing that says it has, you have to take this long to get to this level. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And so if you crush it and you work in a meritocracy, yeah, there's an opportunity to leapfrog and create an uncompetitive advantage for yourself. Yeah. Well, I think that's um, all the time we have, man. Um, cool. But yeah. uh, thank you for, for the, the advice on all this. Of course. Thank you for uh, chatting with me, and thanks for doing this. This is awesome. Yeah. This is really great. Thank you. All right. That's all for today. A couple quick admin items. Uh, first of all, uh, still playing around with the best way to provide resources to active duty military. If you have suggestions for specific information that would be helpful to you in transitioning or the best way to present that information, drop me a note at beyondtheuniform.io. Would love and appreciate that feedback. Um, second of all, uh, lots of data on beyondtheuniform.io, different thoughts on industries, functional roles, size of companies, how your background plays into that, and starting to look at salary information as well um, uh, and uh, how that might affect your decision. So check out more at beyondtheuniform.io and see you next week with another interview.